subsequent uh, session. My <coughs> name is uh, Paul Heitjans from Leibniz Universität Hannover in Germany from physical chemistry. The first talk, this invited talk, is by David Carpentier, as you see here from CNAS and École Normale Supérieure de Lyon. And it's, of course, a special day, 14 juillet, <laughs> <laughs> on topo topological insulators and semiconductor metals. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to thank, of course, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk uh, today about uh, a subject which is, um, I, I'm completely aware that it's really kind of remote from the, the core of this, uh, this conference. It's not really what you're a specialist of. So I was asked really to give a, a pedagogical introduction to this notion of topological insulators and I'll talk also about, about semi-metals, associated uh, phases. Uh, so please interrupt me as soon as you, you, you feel lost, as soon as you, you feel that I'm not pedagogical enough and that you need uh, uh, more, more details. So uh, this, this subject is a, a subject which, which mixes two completely different domains, one with uh, which you're, you're familiar, the band theory of solids, and a domain of mathematics which is rather abstract and a priori that doesn't have anything to do with band theory, which is the domain of topology in mathematics. So I'll first actually give you an idea of what are these two domains, and actually that explains, uh, bringing together these two completely different domains, why it's a different domain to capture. Why really, my aim to, to, today is really to give you a first hint of what all, the, all this is about without giving you all the technical details. So first, band theory of solids. Well, you're all familiar, it describes how uh, the electron behaves in a crystal. So we learn from quantum mechanics when, uh, when you describe an, uh, electrons around an atom, you know that they are distributed in orbitals with, uh, with discrete energies. When you bring together two atoms, well, electrons can delocalize on the two, uh, two atoms, and so you have a slight splitting of the energies of uh, these electrons uh, on, on each atom. And when you do that on a, on a whole crystal, you end up with bands instead of uh, atomic orbitals. So that's something you're all, all familiar with, band theory of solids. I'll come back to that in a moment. The crucial point, the, one of the main consequences you get from this band theory of solids is that you know how to differentiate insulators of, uh, of whom you, you, you're all familiar with, uh, where I have a gap that separates occupied states, valence states, uh, valence band from uh, conduct on, uh, conducting bands, and, and that, as opposed to metals. So that's really what I'm going to focus today, insulators, where I have, in an ambiguous way, uh, a, a clear distinction between occupied states and uh, empty states. And topology, so the second, second domain completely different from uh, band theory of solids. So if you open, uh, uh, for example, Wikipedia or any good books on mathematics, uh, you're going to end up with this, with this kind of, of uh, uh, pictures. So topology, it's a domain of mathematics that focuses on objects, uh, properties of objects that are independent of continuous deformation. So what do I, uh, what do I mean really by that? So, so suppose you want here to focus on surfaces, uh, usually are surfaces, for example, a sphere, and you want to characterize all the surfaces that can be obtained from this sphere by continuous deformation. You, end, you start with a soccer ball, you end up with a rugby ball or whatever surface you can smoothly deform, and you, you want to, to, uh, to collect all these surfaces and say they have the same topology, they have the same property because they can be, they can be continuously deformed one into the other. And of course, that's not the case of the donut here, of the torus. Uh, how, however strong you, you try here, you can never deform a sphere into a torus. Okay? They, they, they have different intrinsic properties that, that dictate that you cannot deform one into the other. And mathematicians tell you that they have different topology. So they say all the objects that can be deformed one into the other have the same topology. When, the, when you cannot do, do so, it's, uh, they have different topology. And so you end up with a classification of surfaces depending on whether or not you can deform uh, one into the other. And, and uh, you need a, a number, something that is going to tell you to which class does a given surface belong, uh, uh, does a, uh, a surface belong to. And this, uh, historically, this number was called the Euler characteristic, which basically counts the number of holes you have in these surfaces. Here you have one hole, three holes, etc. And it counts this number of holes and tells you uh, to which class actually the surfaces belong to. So today I'm not really going to talk about surfaces in, uh, in, uh, in our space. 
I'm going to talk about a different kind of topology, but still what, what you should remember is that whenever you hear topology, you're talking about properties that are robust with respect to, to continuous deformation. So in physics, actually, it's not the first time uh, these topological insul insulators where we encounter these tools. And actually, the first time, I guess, in condensed matter was when we, uh, when we classify in the 70s uh, the, the topological defects of ordered phases. So that was the uh, uh, first time where really topology was a useful tool to classify defects. So what, are, what are, do I mean by topological defects? Well, they, they can be vortices, for example, in superconductor or super, super fluid film, dislocation, disclinations, uh, skirmions, etc. But in all these cases, what you're try, trying to do is uh, describe uh, the defect of an ordered phase. So when you describe an ordered phase, you first identify the type of, of order you're, you're dealing with, and uh, that usually is associated with the notion of order parameter. Here what I'm drawing is uh, the case of a, a phase which is described by, uh, by a phase, let's say an angle, or the phase of a superfluid or superconductor. So in an ordered phase, all these phases are correlated, they all point to the same direction. When I look at a defect on this phase, what I'm going to consider is really a singularity of this order parameter. And a vortex, in this case, corresponds to a point here where this order parameter is ill-defined, and moreover, here you see that I, I'm, I, I'm, I've created a defect associated with a, a winding of a phase of my superfluid or, or space. Okay? So here, basically, you end up with a classification of defects, so that's the, the winding, that depends on the type, whether there are points, lines, or planes, or whatever, and the type of order, actually, which is going to, to tell you what is uh, happening around this defect. Okay? So in this case, what I'm doing here is you can realize that uh, whatever the path that I'm considering that winds clockwise around my defect, the phase here, the, uh, this arrows, also wind once uh, around this defect. Okay, that's a plus one vortex. So that's, that's what uh, people learn in the 70s, how to classify all possible defects uh, for this, uh, this other parameter for these fields. Okay, so that's all, all, all story in the 70s. But uh, you can imagine, starting from this situation, that I can end up with a more complex situation if, instead of looking at a, a set of rows or vectors or whatever on the plane, I consider them on a sphere. So that's slightly, I warn you, too, that slightly, this domain is slightly uh, uh, abstract. So here, people in mathemat mathematics consider exactly a set of rows, but instead of considering them on the plane, they look at them on surfaces. And as soon as you do that, you realize that now you can have problems. If I do that on the, on the torus, I can end up with a, a perfectly well-defined uh, vector field here, it, which has no, no defects, and uh, they are all moving together, all these arrows, so that's an ordered phase on this, on this uh, uh, torus. But you, you realize that on the sphere, you can never find such a field. Meaning, as soon as I look, for example, at the direction of wine on, on the sphere, I know necessarily that I will have defects, I will have vortices for this uh, field on the, on the sphere. And that's called in mathematics the Haribol theorem, um, which tells you that uh, actually it's, it's a property of the, the type of surface you consider and the type of vectors you put on them. Okay, so here it's arrows, so phases uh, of, a, of a vector field on top of a sphere, and it's a property of the, the, both the, this, uh, this sphere and the type of vector, so what's, uh, what's called a vector bundle, a base space and the type of vectors you put on them. So that's really uh, this object that we consider in, in band theory, as I will, uh, will show. And here we, we realize that we can have different type of topology of properties of this, uh, of this uh, uh, vector bundles, uh, which in some cases can uh, have, uh, necessarily have defects. They have non-trivial topology. In other cases, you can find continuous fields without any defect on this base space, okay? So that's really the kind of topology or topological property that I'm going to consider in the following, uh, in the remaining of my talk. So now that I've basically give you a cartoon of all of these two domains and what we are going, uh, now we, I'm going to enter into slightly more details how actually we can, uh, what I need of band theory to describe the mathematical objects uh, and, and to consider their topological property. Then in the next part, I'll, I'll, I'll really explain what's a topological insulator, an insulator where I have such uh, topological properties. And if time allows, in time, time permits in the last part of my talk, I will talk about what happens at the surface of these insulators. That's really 
the key point for the, the properties of these uh, 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 materials, the fact that you have an, uh, strange metals, I mean, uh, relativistic metals at the surface of these insulators, and that's uh, what I will call the semi-metals. So first, band theory. Band theory, well, if, if you remember your textbooks, uh, basically what we want is diagonalize a single uh, electron Hamiltonian on a crystal. Uh, you, start, you end up with, per, per atom, a, a few uh, a degree of freedom, three or few orbitals, and then you want to take advantage of the periodi periodicity of your crystal. So in quantum mechanics, what uh, this amounts to is diagonalize simultaneously your Hamiltonian and all the set of translation uh, of your Bravais lattice that leaves uh, the problem invariant, that leaves the crystal invariant. So when doing so, actually, you, when you diagonalize simultaneously this uh, Hamiltonian and all these uh, this, uh, uh, translation operators, you end up with eigenstates of these transition operators, which are actually the famous, the, the familiar block uh, wave functions. Okay, block wave functions are really states that are uh, uh, eigenstates of the transition operators of my Bravais lattice. So they behave almost like plane waves, uh, except that they are indexed by a momentum which cannot take any, any, uh, uh, any value. You realize that uh, two momentum that differ by a reciprocal, a reciprocal lattice vector describe exactly the same block, uh, block wave function. So that's uh, the key point in my case. So that's just a sketch of what we do in, in band theory. Uh, what we really do is we identify, in this case, uh, two momentum that differ by reciprocal lattice vectors that amounts to, co to consider quasi-momentum only in the first Brillouin zone. But you realize, actually, that this first Brillouin zone is actually a torus. It depends on the dimension, but it's a torus. And why is it a torus? Because uh, the opposite uh, sides of this first Brillouin zone differ by a reciprocal lattice vector. So you should identify them because they correspond exactly to the same eigenstates. And if you do so, just take a, a sheet of paper, you identify here the opposite uh, 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 boundaries in every direction, you end up with a surface that doesn't have any boundary, you always come back to where you started if you move in one direction, that's a torus. Okay? So the first Brillouin zone, actually, it's a d-dimensional torus. And what we are doing when we are doing band theory is for every value here of this first Brillouin zone or, or, or torus, you diagonalize your block Hamiltonian, you identify a set of vectors, okay, the eigenstate of your, of your Hamiltonian. And you start actually understanding the relation with this uh, Haribol theorem. So uh, now that I've defined the fact uh, that this Brillouin zone is a, is a torus, I can actually summarize what we are doing in band theory. For every point here of this quasi-momentum, you diagonalize your block Hamiltonian, you end up with a set of energies, a set of eigenstates, of vectors, and when you move in your Brillouin zone, you end up with your energies and fields associated with these energies. Okay, so that's what we do, we always do, when you do simple band theory without any effect of interactions. So, um, uh, of course, now the natural question, sorry, is, uh, you, you realize that I've defined exactly the analogous uh, quantity, so which it's called a vector bundle, analogous quantity to the Haribol theorem. Uh, I'm considering here a base space, which is my torus, and on top of that, a set of vectors, so vector fields on, on, onto this base space, and so that defines the, the basic object of, uh, of uh, uh, band theory, which are vector bundles. And now the natural question, in view of these topological properties, is whether or not I can define continuously these vectors on my Brillouin zone or not. And so whether or not I actually have topological defects associated with these vectors corresponding to a non-trivial topology of my, of my eigenstates. Okay? So that's what I, I'm, I'm uh, sketching here is we, when you consider these vectors and, and, and you evolve around this uh, base space, are you in this situation where I have no topological defect, so a trivial case? or a situation like this, this, uh, this ball, where I have necessary points where my, my uh, eigenstates vanish or cannot be defined. Okay, so that's the topological property, uh, a cartoon of what uh, are these uh, topological properties of bands in, a, in, a, an, uh, uh, in, a, in, in any gay crystal. Uh, and uh, actually, when you realize mathematically, actually, when you consider all the bands in a, in a solid, you always uh, realize that you have no topological property associated with all these vectors. It's a, it's a mathematical property, and it explains actually why 
for so long, this kind of, uh, of topology didn't play any role in physics because most of the time um, it, it's trivial, so you don't even need to consider it, except if you are able, some, by, by, by some process, to split this ensemble of vectors into two completely different uh, set of vectors. They don't talk to each other, and you, you are able then to consider a subset, let's say the first one, or the first P uh, eigenstate, then this subset of vectors can acquire a non-trivial topology. It's only when, you, when you're able to split your total Hilbert space into two different Hilbert spaces that you can have the topological properties. So what, what do I mean? Well, I mean exactly considering an, uh, an insulator. When you have an insulator, you have bands, and you know that you have an energy gap that separates your states into the valence band states, the conduction band states, in an unambiguous way. That's clear from the start, you know, here, that you have a set of eigenstates that describe basically the ground state of your insulator. You have actually a physical process that splits your Hilbert space into two different parts, and each of them can now acquire a non-trivial topology. So that's why these topological properties are associated with the physics of insulators, because you need to be able to split these, two, these, uh, these vectors into two different sets uh, that don't uh, uh, talk to each other. And so, now, in view of this, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, story, a topological insulator is nothing but an insulator where the ensemble of, ve uh, of states here describing, uh, corresponding to the valence bands possess a non-trivial topology. So that means, in, other, in, a, in another world, in another way of saying it, that the ground state of, uh, of a topological insulator possess a non-trivial topology because it corresponds exactly to this ensemble of vectors on the pre one zone. Okay? And it took a long time, actually, to identify this property because, actually, they are, not, they are uh, not very, they are kind of rare in nature, but that's really now understood that uh, that's uh, a, a, a basic property, a, a topological property of this ground state. Uh, so now we need tools. Remember, uh, initially, I, I described for these surfaces the Euler index. We need a, a way to calculate, without looking at all these eigenstates, whether or not my ground state is trivial or not. I'm not going to enter into the details because that's rather technical, but I'm going to give you a hint of what can occur. Uh, and this hint has to do with, um, well, what can happen in, 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 an ensemble, in angle states on, on the Brie 1 zone. Suppose you diagonalize point by point actually your, your, your block Hamiltonian, you end up with uh, the eigenstate. You all know that you can find eigenstate in all the Brie 1 zone. Uh, uh, you never realize, understand, uh, realize the situation where you, there's a point in the Brie 1 zone where I cannot define my eigenstate. That doesn't, that doesn't exist. It's because actually here what I'm considering is a, proce a procedure that allows to define this eigenstate in a continuous way. I want to move in a continuous way this eigenstate in the Brie 1 zone. And when doing so, I have to, to pay special attention to the phase of my eigenstates. Usually when you're doing numerical di di diagonalization, you don't care about the phase of your eigenstate. Here, I want this phase to evolve continuously in my Brie 1 zone just to detect this topological property because I want this, this, uh, these vectors to be defined continuously, like for the initial case of my vectors, of, uh, where, which were all pointing in the same direction. So I need a very special procedure, actually, to define in a continuous way eigenstates on my Brie 1 zone, and it's only when you pay this special attention that you realize that you cannot do it everywhere in the Brie 1 zone, so define in a continuous way the phase of my eigenstates, and when you cannot define them in a, everywhere, that means you have a, a non-trivial topology, a topological insulator. Okay? So, this, uh, so that, that's really something non-trivial. Uh, implementing it numerically, it's, uh, it's, uh, it requires some work, and we have tools actually now to, 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 to look at the variation of phases uh, as, as a function of parameter. So in physics, we, an analogous situ situation is this Aranov-Bohm effect that I will describe in a moment, and the associated Berry phase of uh, how the phase of, a, of an eigenstate evolves as a function of a parameter. So first, Aranov-Bohm, well, you've all learned actually that when I consider this kind of, uh, of conductor, so at a microscopic scale, a micron scale typically, which is threaded ma magnetic field, so you can imagine that actually the magnetic field doesn't uh, uh, enter the, the, the metal. It's only going through here, this small, uh, uh, the, the, the inside of the conductor. And you know that actually electrons going uh, on one side or on the other side will be dephased with respect to the other one uh, by an amount, uh, by, by a quantity which depends on the flux that's threading this sample. Okay, so it's a, it's a unique quantum uh, 
uh, effect. Classic, classically, if you don't encounter a magnetic field, you, you have no effect of a magnetic field. Here, you can have somewhere in space a magnetic field. It will have some effect on the, the phase of the electrons. And that's actually used. For example, uh, that's something that, that you can do uh, uh, experimentally. You, have, you end up with actually uh, uh, a modulation of the current going through this, uh, this small conductor uh, uh, with a period that, uh, uh, of the, the flux that depends on the quantum of flux. Okay, so that's a known effect that uh, is, uh, I'm using here as a first uh, relation between a, 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 a potential here, an electro electric potential, and the phase of a wave function. Okay, here, you realize that the phase of my electrons depends on the integral of the, the, the electromagnetic uh, uh, potential along the, the path along which I'm moving. So, uh, Michael Berry, uh, some, some time ago, realized actually that it's not specific to, uh, to a magnetic field, this uh, relation between a uh, quantity which plays the role of a, a magnetic uh, a ve potential vector and the phase. And actually, he realized that if you consider a Hamiltonian, depending on a, on a parameter, external parameter, and you move slowly this external parameter, now all the eigenstates of this, uh, this Hamiltonian will pick up a phase. And this phase doesn't depend on how fast you change the parameters. It depends only on where in the parameter space you're evolving, okay? Uh, so that's, that's now uh, in, in quantum mechanics textbooks. It's called this Berry, uh, Berry phase. And so the Berry phase, if you, if you uh, consider here in the parameter space one path, the phase that your eigenstate acquire around this, this path is also an integral of uh, uh, something which plays the role of a, a vector potential, a magnetic vector potential, which is called the Berry connection, okay? And analogous to the, to the fl uh, magnetic flux, you have what's called the Berry curvature, which tells you whether or not two paths are associated with the same uh, phase difference or not. And so now we can use these tools in parameter space, uh, and which parameter space? Well, now the, par uh, the quantity that plays the role of this parameter is the momentum in the, in the Brinwine zone. You, st and you start with a, 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 an eigenstate at a given momentum, and you want to see whether its phase is evolving around the, around the, the, the Brinwine zone, and you just use this, uh, this uh, these uh, Berry tools actually to define whether or not you have uh, a flux or whether or not you have uh, a defect in your field. So just to give a hint of how you can do that. Uh, so that's actually everything I've, I've told here is a real old story. It's, uh, it's topological properties of insulators, but for a long time that was really very specific to the physics of the quantum mole effect. So quantum mole effect, if you uh, I guess you all know that it's related to a phase, but which is rather uh, strange in nature. You need to confine electrons on a plane, in a 2D plane, and you apply a very strong magnet transverse magnetic field, and uh, when you do so, you realize that the whole conductivity of your plane becomes quantized. And now it's, it's used actually as a, a quantum of a fine uh, as a way to measure uh, easily the fine structure constant, because the quantization of this whole constant is valid with nine digits. Uh, so it's a, it's a very precise and, uh, and, and strange effect in, uh, in condensed matter. But of course, it has to do with physics in ins extreme uh, situations. So you have to confine in a, in a plane these electrons. You have to apply a few Tesla, uh, a magnetic field of few Tesla. So, but in that context, people realize soon that the quantization here, this whole conductivity uh, uh, in, uh, for this phase had to do with topological property, robustness with respect to continuous deformation manifested itself into the extreme quantization of this whole conductivity for this phase. But it didn't, it did, it didn't really thread the, uh, physics uh, outside of this domain. It was really a, a property of quantum mole effect, this, uh, this topological property. Uh, it was discussed in many different ways by this, uh, these authors. Uh, but it didn't really have an enormous impact outside of, uh, of this uh, specialized domain. Until uh, some, uh, 10 years ago, we actually a different kind of topological property was realized. And a topological property that doesn't require a strong magnetic field, nor the confinement in a plane of electrons. And actually, what uh, Charlie Kane and Jean Mele realized is that, as opposed to this case, they could actually uh, define a new topological property or a new property of, uh, of insulators in the presence of a very strong spin orbit, so which plays uh, an analogous role to the magnetic field, except that you don't break time-reversal symmetry. 
it, and it's, plus it's an intrinsic property of materials. You don't, uh, you can now look in nature to materials with strong spin orbit, and more importantly, it can occur both in 2D, like here, and in bulk 3D materials. And that's where actually the field really uh, started to explode. It's when we realized that bulk materials in nature, without any, uh, any uh, 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 extreme uh, uh, conditions, could actually possess such a, a topological property and could display uh, amazing properties that I will discuss. So that was a, a really a, no, a property of band structures as opposed to here to this, uh, this uh, specific phase. And uh, we had actually to reconsider band structure of many compounds in, in presence of uh, spin orbit. And now it evolved in completely, it's a whole domain. Now we have many different kind of topological orders that I won't discuss here, but that builds really on this, uh, this uh, pioneering work of Charlie Kane and Jean Mele. So uh, that's just a, a, a non-exhaustive list actually of all the compounds. Now uh, uh, there have been a lot of compounds that have been identified as being topological insulators, both in 2D, so in this new type of order, I'll talk about them, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, quantum wells of uh, mercury telluride in cadmium tellurides, and a whole class of bismuth compounds uh, with strong spin orbit. Uh, and now we, we have what, what people call the third class of topological insulators, uh, and, and the list is really growing continuously. Uh, so first, spin orbit coupling. Why, why does it, uh, what's crucial here in spin orbit? So it's uh, initially, it, it's, it's, uh, you can view it as a first relativistic correction of the Schrodinger equation. So it's a, uh, an effect what, that requires electrons that moves rather fast uh, because it's a relativistic correction. And actually, that you can relate that to the fact that it, it, it has to do with uh, very heavy atoms. You're considering electrons close to the core of heavy atoms. Uh, um, so this, uh, it's, a, it's a coupling between the spin, the momentum, and that basically grows like z to the power of 4. Uh, so we, you really have to look at compounds with, uh, with high z to, uh, for uh, this uh, spin orbit to, uh, to play some role. What is crucial here is that it's going to, to lift the spin degeneracy of bands. So now bands will depend on the spin of the electrons. You will have different energies depend, depending on the spin of the electrons. And also it preserves time reversal symmetry as opposed to a quantum, uh, to a, a magnetic field. So it's, it's a different uh, uh, physics-wise, uh, symmetry-wise, it's a different uh, uh, pr uh, perturbation that, uh, than an, an external magnetic field. So let me mention briefly the constraints, uh, give you a, an idea of why actually this such a, such a, a potential, a spin orbit potential, is going to constrain the topology of states on the Brillouin zone, and why actually it's a difficult matter, and uh, we had to wait to 2005 to understand it. So first, time reversal symmetry. I've just briefly mentioned that uh, spin orbit uh, preserves time reversal symmetry. In quantum mechanics, time reversal, it's, a, it's a, an unusual property. It's an unusual symmetry. It's not uh, represented by a, a standard unitary operator. It's anti-unitary. But what is, what's important here is that it reverses, of course, momentum, the direction of propagation, but it, it also reverses spins. Think of spins as a small uh, quantized uh, angular momentum. It reverses these spins, and you can view it in spin space as a pi rotation. And so what, what the, conce the immediate consequence of this uh, property is that if you consider spin one half, or half integer spins, like electrons, if you apply twice time reversal symmetry, you end up with minus identity. Because a two pi rotation in spin space, it's not identity, it's minus identity. And as a consequence, Kramer's uh, very uh, long ago immediately realized that when you have time reversal symmetry, necessarily your spectrum is, is, uh, is twofold degenerate. As soon as you have an eigenstate of your Hamiltonian, then its, it's time reverse is also an eigenstate, and it's orthogonal because of this minus one theta psi is orthogonal to, to psi. So as soon as you have time reversal symmetry, your spectrum is necessary to fall degenerate. So now that's very general in quantum mechanics. What about uh, uh, band theory in solids? Well, in band theory, we realize that immediately that this constraint is highly non-trivial because of this relation between momentum k and minus k. What does that mean? That means that as soon as I have an eigenstate in my brain one zone here with an eigen, a, a given energy, time reversal symmetry and for also the fact that I have a different eigenstate, but at a different point in the brain one zone with the same energy. So it relates eigenstate in different, in different points in my brain one zone. It's not a trivial constraint to, uh, to consider. And uh, a priori, so it's non-local, it relates k and minus k, except now that you have in the brain one zone points where k and minus k are equal. And because 
all your momenta are defined up to a reciprocal lattice vectors, you have actually, in, in dimension two, you, you have four points, four such points, because uh, k equals minus k up to reciprocal lattice vectors means that k is half reciprocal lattice vector, okay? And you have here these four points, so here I'm drawing a very sketchy uh, Brillouin zone, uh, a square Brillouin zone. You have, of course, the, the lambda point, zero, zero, which is sent onto itself by minus k, but you have also this point, as you apply, if, if you look at minus lambda one, that's this point, but they differ by a reciprocal lattice vector. They correspond exactly to the same point. So you have four points where k and minus k are identical in a Brillouin zone in 2D. You have eight in, four, in, uh, in 3D. And that means that exactly at these four points, my spectrum will be twofold degenerate. Because now time reversal symmetry acts locally at these four points. At k, k and minus k are equal. So time reversal symmetry sends an eigenstate onto an eigen, another eigenstate at the same k point. So you have here a spectrum which is, which is degenerate at these four points, and a priori non-degenerate de, non non elsewhere. Okay. So as soon as you realize this property, you, uh, you understand that time reversal symmetry. It's a real nightmare to understand it in, uh, in the pre one zone. Okay. You have really to keep track of all these eigenstates non-locally. Uh, so it's really a non-local constraint. Uh, so to be, uh, to be, just to summarize what I've just said, let me look at the spectrum here on the line that, uh, that uh, cross two of these uh, time reversal invariant momenta. So as I said, exactly at these four points, if I consider uh, a, a given band with two spins, I will have here bands that are degenerate at this time reversal invariant momenta. And a priori elsewhere, if I have a spin orbit coupling, well, the bands will be uh, non-degenerate. Non the, degener the spin degeneracy will be lifted by the coupling. Okay? So it, it's really a, a, a different constraint to keep track of the, the topology now, the smooth evolution of these states on the Brillouin zone, and it's really what has been understood since uh, 2005, uh, very recently. So it's really the consequence of this constraint that brings this new kind of, uh, of properties in, uh, in uh, insulators. And so I won't enter into all the details of uh, this, uh, this new property devised by Kane, uh, Charlie Kane and Jean Mele. But at the end of the day, here there's a key point that, uh, uh, that, that can be remembered. It's that this new index depends solely uh, of only the parity of the bands below the gap and only at these four points. So that's kind of uh, highly uh, non-intuitive to understand. But you should actually look at only the parity of the bands below the gap at these four points. And if uh, you change the sign of one of these bands with respect to a standard insulator, you're going to end up with a topological insulator. Let me actually, so I, that's what, what I, I'm, I'm uh, writing here. This new index is going to count the number of inverted bands. What does that mean precisely? So let us consider a precise example, mercury telluride, which has very similar uh, band structure to cadmium telluride, they are very similar. You have a stronger spin orbit in, in mercury telluride. And when you look at the band structure, you, you realize that uh, here you have a, a slight difference of nature of bands around the gamma point. So let me zoom around this gamma point uh, uh, for, for these two cases. You realize that in the case of mercury telluride, you, had, you started with uh, S and P orbitals. Because of spin orbit, you had some degeneracy lifting. And the P three half orbitals lied on top of the S orbitals. If you consider cadmium telluride, well, you have a different ordering of the bands. You have S orbitals that uh, lie on top of P type orbit orbitals. What's crucial here is that these two type of bands have opposite parities. They have uh, exactly, I mean, some of them are positive parities and, and negative parities. So that means that because of uh, this band inversion occurring at one of the points of the Brillouin zone, one of these two compounds is going to be a topological uh, insulator. So that's the, the recipe that I've been used now to look for topological insulators, is to look for uh, materials with strong spin orbit and with a band inversion with respect to known compounds in one of the, one of the Brillouin zone, exactly uh, uh, as occurs in this mercury telluride. So I'm slightly cheating here, cheating here because mercury telluride, it's not an insulator. You, you have a band touching here. So to, uh, to, to obtain an insulator, of course, you need to open the gap, to lift some, uh, some uh, symmetry that, that uh, enforces this band touching. So how to open a gap, how to obtain a, a topological insulator out of mercury telluride? One first way to open a gap is to quantize, well, you confine your electrons uh, in, a, in a quantum well. 
So you now you quantize the momentum transverse to the, to the well, and you end up with a 2D phase, which is an insulator, and with this topological property, this band inversion, that was the first historical uh, uh, example of uh, these new topological insulators in 2D. So very soon after the initial work, theoretical work, the group of um, Lawrence Mellencamp in, uh, in Würzburg uh, very fast understood, uh, with the help of Sushan Zhang, how to uh, use these uh, quantum wells of mercury telluride to uh, obtain these new, uh, new topological phases. And um, now there are a few other groups working on this. So that's one first way to uh, open a gap in mercury telluride is to, to confine it. Another way, actually, is to impose some stress, some, uh, some stress on mercury telluride, which is exactly, exactly going to, to break the rotational symmetry that enforces the band touching. So how do you apply a stress? Well, you grow mercury telluride on top of cadmium telluride, and you grow uh, uh, here uh, samples that are not too thick, because otherwise you're going to generate dislocations and you're going to relax the constraint. So if you grow mercury telluride here, that's typically samples of uh, up to 150 nanometers, you end up with a bulk mercury telluride, which is constrained by the slight mismatch, a lattice mismatch between mercury telluride and cadmium telluride. So you, that imposes a slight uh, uh, constraint uh, pressure on mercury telluride that's sufficient to open a gap. And that's how, now that's one of the f uh, cases, uh, examples uh, of 3D, now because it's a, it's a bulk material, topological insulator, on which, well, we are working with people in, uh, in Cervality in Grenoble and in situ. Uh, Neel, as well as the, the group of Lawrence Mollenkamp in, uh, in uh, Wolfsburg. So that was just re, um, uh, an overview, a sketch of uh, what we are talking about when we consider a topological insulator. But all this is really far from any physical property or application. Uh, I'm really talking about abstract characterization of uh, electron wave functions in a, in a, in a bulk material. Without uh, mentioning, we don't see how this could have anything to do with physics because with, with, with uh, properties. That's really an abstract way to classify uh, to classify insulators. How is this going to matter on some very uh, uh, measurable quantities? Well, let me now move actually to the last part of my talk on this uh, uh, semi-metals or strange metals at the surface of these topological insulators, and let me consider. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to, to enter again uh, details. Let me consider an interface between two insulators, so two materials with bulks on both sides, with uh, gaps on both sides, but one of them possessing this strange topological property. What does that mean? That means that below the gap here, this ensemble of state possess this uh, topological property, as opposed to here, the other side of the interface, where I'm considering a trivial insulator. And so now let's, let's imagine actually uh, 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 describing the evolution of the band structure at the interface between th these two insulators. When you do that quantum mechanically, natural way to do it is, well, to deform here all these valence band states into all the uh, valence band states on the other side. You don't want to close the gap, you just deform uh, with uh, position dependent uh, uh, parameters uh, of your Bullock Hamiltonian, you deform this ensemble of states into this ensemble of states. Okay, that's how you describe usually interfaces between uh, uh, insulating materials. But now you realize actually that that's not possible because when doing so, what you're, do what you're doing is finding a continuous way to deform this ensemble of states into this ensemble of states. And this continuous deformation is really the extrapolation as a function of the position across the interface. We are considering a set of Hamiltonians that depends on space, that's uh, around the interface, and we, we look at their eigenstate and we smoothly deform them into the eigenstate on the other side. Of course, that's not possible because I've told you, without entering into the details, that here I have a property which is topological. Topological means completely independent of smooth deformation of my states. So that means that I cannot connect here an ensemble of states that have this property, non trivial property, to an ensemble of states that's trivial, that doesn't have this property. So the simple fact that it's a topological property means that whatever the interface, whether it's disordered, whether it's clean, whether it's, uh, you, you modify it chemically, you cannot deform these states into this one. So necessarily, this, not, this is not possible. So how do you solve then for the physics at the interface? Well, at the beginning, I've, I've told you here, I have a topological property of all the states below the gap. 
But if I consider all the states, including those above the gap, they are trivial. That's what I, I said at, at, at some point. So now there's another way, actually, to, def uh, to, uh, to, to deform continuously the second state, is bringing one of the states from the conduction band into a valence band on the other side, and vice versa. Okay? So I need to use, actually, the, the, the vectors corresponding to the, to the uh, conduction band to describe the interface because of this notion of topological property of the, the states below the gap. When doing so, what am I doing? Well, I'm closing the gap at the interface, so I'm creating a metal at the interface. Okay? So that's very strong, that's the key point, actually, of all this physics. As soon as you have here a topological property of the states below the gap, you will have a manifestation of this physics as a metal at the interface. You have what people call a, a bulk a, a boundary uh, correspondence, and these states are unique, as I'm going to describe. They are really a clear manifestation of uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, abstract pr property of the states below the gap. So detecting, actually, this uh, surface state is really the key now to understand, uh, to, to detect these topological insulators. So here I'm stressing that I'm considering the interface between two bulk materials in 3D, and I, I end up here with a, a phase which is going to be a metal, which is going to be a, a, an interface metal, so a surface in D equals two metal, with a bank, uh, bank closing at, uh, at one point in the Brillouin zone. So actually that's a cartoon of all, of some of the, of, of the different manifestations at the surface of this, uh, these various topological properties. So I've told you quantum all effect. I was breaking time aerosol symmetry and that manifests its, by, by, by the magnetic field. And that manifests itself as uh, the type of metal you end up. So that's a 2D phase. And at the, the surface, no, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, really windy. You have a metal, but with all the, the electrons moving in one direction, that's the physics of the quantum metal effect. If you do now, if you consider this new type of topological insulators that don't break time aerosol symmetry, you end up with two states moving in opposite direction. And necessarily, because of time aerosol symmetry, they, they carry opposite spins. If you have spin up moving in one direction, because of time aerosol symmetry, spin down has to move in the opposite direction. So you have what's called now a helical uh, metal at the surface of this, uh, this uh, 2D phase obtained in quantum wells. And 3D, 3D now we have what I'm going to discuss now. You close the gap at one point in your Brillouin zone, and we have what I'm going to call a Dirac, uh, a Dirac cone, a very strange metal, unique in nature. So wh why am I calling it actually a, a Dirac, uh, Dirac cone or Dirac electrons? Because as I've told you, I know that at the surface of these topological insulators, I'm going to close the gap at one point in my Brillouin zone. Well, without any, any uh, understanding of the phase, I know that my block Hamiltonian is a, locally, because I have two bands crossing, is going to be described by a two by two matrix. So a two by two matrix can be uh, a, a Hamiltonian two by two matrix, or Hamiltonian can be fully uh, parameterized by the poly uh, matrices. And if you look at the, the spectrum of these poly matrices, you know that this, it spect this spectrum has to exactly vanish here. You have two bands that, that uh, cross. So that means actually the, the generic Hamiltonian describing such a band crossing is sigma x, the first poly matrix times qx plus sigma y times qy. Okay, that's uh, generic parameterization of a Hamiltonian whose spectrum is vanishing at one point uh, of the brain one zone. So locally around this point, it's going to take this form. Uh, and the crucial point is that this is a highly unusual Hamiltonian and you have to remember lectures on, on relativistic quantum mechanics. So Dirac, very long ago, actually derived a way to describe relativistic particles in quantum mechanics. And to do so, he had to introduce anti-commuting uh, uh, matrices. How many matrices? You had P alpha, so D alpha, D being the dimension of space, plus one, uh, one associated with a mass. So you need D plus, uh, plus one matrices. Now, you compare these two, these two uh, Hamiltonian, and you realize that your uh, sigma, your poly matrices, anti-commute. You have three of them. You're in 2D. You have exactly a Dirac equation. So actually, this, this equation is nothing but a, a, a Hamiltonian for relativistic particles, except that you don't have this alpha not term, so they are massless relativistic particles. And uh, what does that mean? That means that now you're considering a metal which is described by a rel relativistic equation of motion, relativistic uh, quantum uh, physics. That means that whenever you have a linear band crossing, what you're going to consider is properties of 
massless relativistic particles. The electronics of this, uh, of this phase is going to be the electronics of massless relativistic particles with very funny and unusual properties uh, that I, uh, if I have uh, some time, I will describe. So that's re a key point is that a way to realize this, this, uh, this uh, uh, Dirac uh, uh, crossing, this, uh, this new metals associated with uh, 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 relativistic physics, is to look at the surface of this, uh, these topological insulators. So it's not unique, actually, in nature. Uh, if, you, if you've heard about uh, graphene that uh, was uh, awarded some time ago a uh, Nobel Prize, we know that in graphene, which is a sheet of carbon atoms, uh, you have an, an hexagonal here lattice. And when you look at the dispersion relation of the PZ orbitals in graphene, you have actually two points where you have a linear band crossing. So you also have this Dirac physics in graphene, and that's why it was awarded the Nobel Prize. Because uh, if you look at the initial paper, they really look at specific properties that were a signature of this anomalous physics associated with relativistic physics. And so what's the difference? Now I've told you at the surface of a topological insulator, I also have Dirac physics. Well, the, the key point is that here, uh, we have a degeneracy, we have two valleys, we have two points and spin, as opposed to here where you have a single cone. And uh, you remember when I wrote the Dirac equation, I had a sigma. In the case of topological insulator, it's a real spin that winds around the dispersion relation, as opposed to graphene. So here, people, for example, uh, I'm collaborating with people in Leti who are really interested in spintronics. In this case, we know that in a given direction, I have only a given spin. So if you want to control spin, you just have to control the direction of motion of the, the particles as opposed to, to graphene. So that's, there are similarities and differences between these topological surface states and, and uh, uh, graphene. So uh, now that I've told you what, what are uh, the physical consequences of these topological properties, the existence of these surface states, that's how actually we know we we, uh, uh, we find actually the physics of this, uh, the existence of this topological insulator is we look for these Dirac surface states. So here that's experiments uh, from a group with whom I'm collaborating in Grenoble on this uh, bulk mercury telluride. You're doing your best, so you're kicking out electrons in a controlled way to, to, to really uh, look at the dispersion relation of the surface electrons. And you realize here that you find a very nice Dirac cones uh, of electrons that uh, are really located at the surface because the dispersion relation doesn't depend on Kz, doesn't depend on energy. And so, uh, and you can compare, of course, uh, what we're doing in this business is always comparing uh, RPES with band structure calculation uh, with a clear signature here of the surface states. So that's, uh, and it's been uh, done, so I was showing a, a recent work uh, with people in Grenoble, but since the beginning, that's how people have really detected in 3D the existence of this, uh, these topological insulators is mostly by, uh, by uh, photo emission, by RPES, uh, including spin-dependent RPES to, to be able to detect the fact that you have a spin winding around, uh, around your Dirac cone uh, with the stability of these cones up to room temperature. Okay. So uh, before uh, uh, concluding, because I'm, I'm, I'm seeing that time is flying by, I want to, 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 to flash really uh, the last evolution of this domain. How, uh, what are the real, uh, what people are interested in uh, uh, in this domain? So what I've just described is a cartoon of how you, you, you describe an interface between a topological insulator and a trivial insulator, and where necessarily, uh, as a function of the position with respect to the interface, you end up with a metal here at the interface. But you could play exactly the same game if you replace the position by let's say a chemical constituent of a chemical constitution of this uh, insulator. If I'm considering instead of uh, interface a phase diagram, uh, for example, when I dock mercury telluride with cadmium, I, knew that, I know that I cannot continuously uh, uh, change the band structure of this mercury telluride, this topological insulator, into the band structure of a trivial insulator. So I will necessarily have at some point a phase transition now, and not the interface, a phase transition why I cross the gap, where, where the gap closes, where I have two band crossing. The crucial difference is that here I had a, a Dirac a relativistic metal at the interface, so a two-dimensional metal. Here I'm, I'm, I'm ending up with a critical phase. It's, it's a bulk material which possesses in its bulk some relativistic particles. So that has been really the recent evolution is how to stabilize here uh, phases with a band closing point, uh, a gap closing point in the Brémoin zone to obtain analogous phases in 3D 
to the, to the, the to, to, uh, to these Dirac phases. And that's what I've been done really in the last two years is how to realize, and they have been fun actually, how to realize how to, uh, to, uh, in which compounds to look for these relati relativistic phases in 3D as opposed to 2D with now a whole zoology. So we have much more variety than in high energy physics because there are much more Hamiltonians, possible Ham block Hamiltonians for a band crossing point depending on, on the number of bands that cross. Okay, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll conclude uh, in a moment just by, uh, I haven't talked in detail and that's actually what we do mostly. Uh, it's not really uh, in Lyon. It's really uh, looking at physical properties now of these topological insulators. So physical properties of the existence of the, these Dirac states. Uh, and there are a lot of them. Let me just mention one of them which is, which is uh, crucial, which is this Klein paradox. Uh, when you consider uh, a potential barrier uh, in quantum mechanics, you know that you can cross it by, uh, ton uh, uh, by a tunnel effect, but if it's really wide, well, it acts like a potential barrier. That's how you, you control your motion of uh, electrons in, uh, in devices. But if you consider now a Dirac particle that you send it normal to this interface, it goes through. So that means you have to devise, to, 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 uh, to imagine different way to control the motion of Dirac particle. So initially, what's, what's amazing uh, from the point of view of history of physics, it, it was a, par a paradox. It's Klein who, who told uh, Dirac, uh, your equation has a problem. You look, uh, it doesn't be, uh, the, uh, the equation of motion doesn't behave as they should with respect to a, a potential barrier. But now it's measured. So it's, it's not a paradox, it's a property of relativistic particles. Of course, you cannot measure it with, uh, with high energy uh, particles, but in, in graphene and at the surface of this topological insulator, you can now really realize that potential barriers are transparent, normal to the direction to, to these uh, surface particles. And so that, uh, no people have imagined different ways to, for example, do uh, transistors with these with this, uh, strange uh, particles. Of course, uh, uh, there are many other properties, including the fact that they are very, uh, they are much less sensitive to disorder, so they are much less diffuse than standard particles, which explain some of our potential applications for a new kind of electronics. Um, so, I w before concluding, I want just to to, uh, to mention uh, the people involved in uh, in um, the work we're doing in Lyon, and in particular here, two PhD students, Michel Frichard, who's a uh, to very smart PhD students. Uh, Michel will defend his thesis right after uh, summer, and Thibault is, uh, is uh, uh, in the middle of his PhD. And we have strong collaboration. I mentioned one of them with uh, serality for the, the gro growth of samples and uh, situnel for the characterization. With the laboratoire Pierre Higrin in the ENS Paris uh, group of Bernard Plessé um, for high uh, frequency measurements in these uh, systems. And uh, with a, uh, a new group in Montpellier around Frédéric Tepp and Eric Tournier on some of these compounds. So uh, let me summarize now really the key points, the, the, the go home message uh, in this, uh, of this talk is that topological insulators where those are materials associated, associated with a, a fancy and, and, and non-trivial property in the bulk, but the, the, the main consequence is the existence at their surface of new type of metals associated with relativistic uh, particles. So particles that behave as if they were going to the speed of light and uh, which leads to, of course, anomalous properties uh, that I, have, I haven't discussed in details, but I will be happy to answer uh, questions with potential application in spintronics that I've mentioned, in quantum computing, because we can uh, define now analogous uh, qubits, very robust qubits in these systems. And in the last part, I've uh, sketched where this domain is re evolving toward realization of these relativistic uh, states, but in bulk materials as opposed to, uh, to surface materials. And uh, with this, I will thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, David, for this uh, really exciting, but I think also quite demanding topic. Are there questions? Please. Crossing yes. the interface uh, needs to keep the 2D periodicity. You, you break on one direction, but you need to keep the 2D periodicity, right? You're absolutely right if I want to describe it within band theory. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But uh, 
Typically, what happens when you do an interface is that you create defects, Absolutely. constructions, yeah. uh, dislocations. So, uh, what happens in nature? I mean, uh, you showed the, the, uh, some uh, uh, band structures uh, that I suppose were bulk band structure where you could interpret, uh, but you showed also the RPES, which was a measurement. Yes. Uh, how many of those materials that you showed uh, have been measured to have this uh, Diracon? So uh, there are two, two parts to your question. The first part is uh, with respect to this periodicity. But actually, it's understood now that even if you lose periodicity, even if you have strong disorder, these surface states remain. And they are very robust, even to the thing is that within band theory, I've, I've, I've defined the bulk, structure, uh, the bulk properties and then uh, extrapolate these Hamiltonians to the surface. But that was be only because that's the only way to do it in a quantitative way. We know from uh, abstract uh, arguments that actually this remains even if we have strong disorder. Actually, we even know um, quantum mechanically, we know that if you have a lot of disorder, you're, you can localize particles by this Anderson localization. Here, it does, it, it, that's a counter example to Anderson, Anderson localization. So uh, that means that we know that even for a, for a very dirty interface, these stains will exist. So they will, they, that's a very strong constraint of the existence of surface state, irrespective, irrespective of the direction of growth, uh, uh, irrespective of whether you have a clean interface or not. Now, some of the details of this surface state will, will, will uh, change depending on whether you have disorder, whether you have, you've grown actually your sample in a given direction or not, but they always exist. Now, for the RPES, um, uh, it's, it's a matter of, of being able to detect them easily or not. Usually, actually, you have to, cl to clean the, the surface. Um, uh, and uh, experimental colleagues have uh, actually shown that if you, have, if you disorder your surface, they remain there uh, as long as you don't have magnetic impurities, as long as you don't break time Russell symmetry. They remain there, but, for example, the shape of the dispersion relation changes. So yeah, there, are, there are details that change depending on the, the, uh, so the chemistry of the surface. But uh, the, the claim, the strong claim, is that the surface state will exist, whatever the, the surface. Does that answer the question? So yeah. even, if you lose the even if I lose completely the periodicity, absolutely. Further questions? Yeah, please. Uh, would you expect the same kind of behavior for deeper bands? Oh, for deeper bands? Yeah. Um, no. Um, uh, and I, I can answer this question. Uh, you, you, uh, you saw that at some point when I, when I gave the recipe to look for topological insulators, I said that you should look for a band, in, a band inversion um, due or related to spin orbit. And usually, if you look at, at strength of spin orbit, it's a rather weak uh, 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 energy. It's a rather weak uh, uh, amplitude. And so actually, that gives you some range of gaps uh, for it, for, for, to look for topological insulators. And typically, most of these compounds are really good infrared detectors because they are in the right range of, uh, of, uh, of energy. Uh, for other reasons, they are also very good uh, thermoconductors. But uh, uh, for deeper bands, um, I, uh, that would mean actually a much larger exchange energy uh, between a standard insulator and, a, and another insulator, so, which is uh, unli highly unlikely uh, due to the amplitude of spin orbit in, uh, in realistic compounds. So usually that has to do only with uh, the, top, uh, uh, the, the top bands, not, not the deeper ones. OK. I don't see further questions. May I just uh, ask a possibly naive question? Uh, in the case of graphene, you have a two-dimensional insulator, topical insulator. What happens if you try to stack graphene layers? What, what, what is, would be the result? Oh, that's, uh, actually, we've worked on um, so gra intrinsic, intrinsic graphene. Uh, is not a topological insulators because the in, intrinsic spin orbit is very weak in, in graphene. Mm -hmm. So, but there have been proposals, and actually we've worked on that to to induce uh, rash bar spin orbit, uh, in particular by by layering uh, materials, graphene with other kind of, of materials, and then to obtain actually 
uh, uh, two plus one dimensional materials, so layered materials. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, it's, it, it's understood actually that you would end up to a 3D material, mm -hmm. but which is uh, considered a weak topological insulator because it, it requires uh, uh, translation invariance in one direction. You need your layer to be exactly periodic for this uh, topological order to exist. So it's not going to be a, a real a bulk material, it's going to be a two plus one, a, a layer 2D ma materials, mm -hmm. but with surface states actually in, a, in every direction. So people have thought about that because that's one trend in graphene right now to, to go to this layer of materials. And that's one way actually to monitor exactly the, the phase you want to achieve. Thank you very much and uh, let's end it.